Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I just want to start by giving you a few things to think about. So let me share this with you. Over 40 years ago, it became illegal, illegal to pay a woman less than a man for doing exactly the same job. OK, so let me give you another one. Women make up less than a quarter of MPs, which means in the global table, we languish in 57th place, astonishingly behind Afghanistan, hardly known for its glowing women's rights. And here's one more. When I checked the retail power list, there were, there were only 13 women out of the top 100. Now, I don't think it's just me, but I think these facts are pretty frightening. So now we are going to talk about why and what needs to be done. And to help me do that, I'd like to introduce you to my expert panel. So first up is Group Chairman and Group CEO of AMV BBDO, also a member of the Women's Business Council. She was listed by Women's Hour as one of the 100 most powerful women in the UK. Please welcome Scylla Snowball. Next up is someone who needs no introduction, the CEO of Sainsbury's. He is also a colleague of mine on the Retail Week Advisory Board and uh, certainly is very vocal about his support for women. Please welcome Mike Coop. I'm also delighted that we also have on our panel Conservative MP for Gosport and Private Secretary to the Right Honourable Nicky Morgan. Under the coalition, they have eliminated all male FTSE 100 boards. Please welcome Caroline Dynage. And last up is the CEO of, of Hallett Retail Group, 2011 winner of the Every Woman Nat West Awards, and who is also a member of the Women's Business Council. Please welcome Wendy Hallett. So right, Caroline, 40 years ago, it became illegal to pay a woman less than a man for doing exactly the same job. I mean, it's not, it's not good enough, really, is it, to no. be in that situation? Well, did, you, did you see that film Made in Dagenham, where Barbara Castle goes off and, and, and fights the fight on behalf of the um, motor company, car, you know, the car workers? You know, and, that's, and it seems like such a long time ago. When you watch the movie, it just seems like um, a, 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 it's a lifetime ago. Um, and yet... The fact that we're still having this conversation today is, is really quite terrifying. I mean, the, the gender pay gap has changed. Um, there, it, it, we virtually eliminated it um, um, among women who are working full-time under the age of 40. So we made progress, but it's still frighteningly high in, um, in other areas and, and, and um, you know, it's something we need to work on. Yeah, I mean, it, it is frightening because I think it sort of sets the tone. You know, I was reading that... You know, a graduate, when, le when they leave a university, will earn 2,000, a female graduate will earn 2,000 pounds less than her male counterpart. Um, and I think this sort of devalues a, a woman's contribution in the workplace right from the beginning and hardly um, you know, gives her confidence that she can you know, reach that, that top level. Uh, do, you, do you have anything to add on that, Silo? Yeah, I mean, uh, we've obviously got to address pay inequality to get to true equality. And I think, you know, the, we need support of men and women to get us there. There's a, a great phrase that says, men of quality don't fear women of quality and inequality. And, and it's a joint effort that will address the pay gap. Um, I think progress has been made. Um, because this is really a, a man's issue as well as a woman's. This isn't just about women, is it? it? affects everybody. Well, it's a business imperative. I think, you know, the, there's countless studies that show that diverse businesses perform better mm. than businesses where there is inequality. So I think it's a, a commercial Im imperative to address pay inequality and inequality generally. 
So just, just to sort of change the theme, I want to move on to quotas because that, you know, is the buzzword at the moment. Um, you know, some countries will say that there is no alternative but quotas. So, Lev, would you agree or disagree? Well, I'm not in favour of quotas at all because I think we've got to do it in a measured and managed fashion. I think the only good thing about quotas would be that it would get the job done quickly. But for me, that's the only good thing about quotas. So, I'm not in favour of quotas, no, but I am in favour of us addressing these issues quickly and hopefully in our lifetimes so that we see the equality quickly. Um, and quotas are a good accelerator, but I, I think we all want a more sustainable solution for the long term. So and I think quotas would be a quick fix. Of what, what does the panel think in terms of an alternative? Is there an alternative to quotas? I think uh, mandatory sh short listing, which is something that we're considering very strongly in our business, is a, is a way of going some way towards a solution. I, I agree with Scylla. I think in the end, quotas take us down the wrong path. And if I talk to the senior women in our business, that's something they would be vehemently opposed to um, because they would feel that it somehow has devalued their accomplishment and achievement in our business. So I think a step on the direction, in the right direction is to have mandatory shortlisting on any number of diversity issues, but not least gender diversity. I know you've yeah. achieved a lot on the FTSE 100 uh, boards. Did you come across any, um, any problems with you know, being dictated to about... Uh, well, I mean, I kind of agree. We get this in politics. We get this a lot that people mm. are saying, you know, that the issue of quotas, the issue of all female shortlists. And, and personally, as somebody who's never been involved in anything like that, it, it almost, as you say, devalues what we have achieved. It's almost as if we're, we're subliminally saying that women are only good enough if we take men out of the equation, which, of course, you know, once you get into the job, men are in the equation and you have to be able to compete um, mm. uh, uh, on, um, in, in, in the workplace. Um, and, it, and it does value what women achieve. I mean, I think the, ish, the big, big issue here is um, actually starts right from the beginning, once from when children go to school um, and the jobs are presented as being girl jobs, boy jobs, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's no, mis it's, you know, the, the reason we have gender inequality in terms of, of, of pay is not because people aren't paid the same, same thing for doing the same job because, you know, they have to by law and if they aren't, then, you know, mm -hmm. we can throw the book at them. The issue is that women aren't doing as well paid jobs as men. You know, it's no um, accident that 92% of secretaries are female but only 7% of engineers. And that's what we have to address right from when youngsters go to school about what potential careers they can have, you know, and, and encouraging them into uh, STEM subjects, encouraging girls to aspire to be businesswomen like yeah. yourself, to be um, uh, doctors, engineers, scientists. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I want to move on in a second, but I, I too totally get there is a big piece to be done around social conditioning and what starts at a very, very, very early age. But what, what's fascinating to me, and, and going back to what Silla was saying earlier about you know, there is a business case. There's plenty of evidence to say that boards that have, you know, mixed uh, gender outperform those that, that just have all male boards. So I, I find it fascinating, you know, Mike, coming back to you, when we, when we look around our, our industry, and, and Wendy as well, um, you know, considering the thousands of women that we employ, the number of women that actually make it onto boards, it, it, it's pathetically poor, really, isn't it, overall? I, I think, for me, the, um, the concern about quotas is you almost take your eye off um, what I feel is one of the biggest problems, which is the pipeline itself. So that if you feel you become, it's a tick box exercise, where I think the biggest, the most important thing is to ensure that even when you do the short list, that the short, you have a good quality of people who want to do those jobs and who are ready for those jobs. So I think we've really got to look at um, right from the start, how we handle um, women when they go on maternity, how they're handled when they come back, um, and the whole flexible working, so that women don't get to different stages in their lives, often when they do return, having had children, um, sometimes also when they take on caring responsibilities, um, when they get perhaps 50 plus, um, and those women then are not in a position to be shortlisted or to get those top yeah. jobs, but they've got to be good enough to get those jobs, not just be given that. I think, you know, the fact that there are still many boards out there, in fact, we were speaking to somebody earlier, uh, just before we came on stage, um, you know, the fact that there are so many boards still out there that do still have all male boards, I mean, 
do you both feel that there, you know, that perhaps some leaders just don't value the female talent? I, I mean, I cannot conceive of operating on a board that doesn't have female representation, especially in a massive food retailer, which in the end, the majority of our customers are women. So, I, I mean, I don't think I've worked my entire career on a board that doesn't have some form of female representation because, to, to Silla's point, I think you just miss a huge amount of difference of view and, and women work in a different way and it adds a, a much broader uh, spectrum and much more colour into the debate that I see around the board table. So, I mean, I've, I have difficulty understanding how businesses so what, so can operate. Mike, what do you think the reason is? Is it, is it culture? Is it because it's quite tough and maybe macho at the top? Or, or are there, is it because there's a lack of flexibility? Well, I mean, how, how do you unpack it? Um, so much of it is about leadership. So much of it starts at the top. You have to have organisations prepared to do the things uh, to help people through the system. Child care is a big issue within businesses and trying to find ways of helping people be helping women be more flexible uh, in their working environment. I think that's a critical issue for us as an industry to uh, get our heads around and, and do a better job of. Uh, in our business, we're beginning to see part-time uh, women store managers. That's a great move on, but I think culturally, that's a massive leap from where we'd have been traditionally. So these types of issues will start to surface uh, perhaps a new generation coming through. It's interesting because you mentioned about um, women and flexible working. For me, one of the real key things is that men also start embracing flexible working because I think if, if fathers could, um, uh, could have more... Well, they've got, they can have flexible working, but I think this is where the culture comes in versus the policy, that we can put as many policies into companies or government can, but it's whether people start... Um, working and the cultures become. So I think if men, if fathers um, worked more flexibly, I think by default that would probably make it easier as well for um, working mothers. So how, how difficult do you think as retailers it is for retailers to you know, implement this flexibility, particularly at board level? I mean, you know, is it feasible to have a part-time uh, you know, working mum at board level? Uh, I, I don't see why not. And it's quite an we have a quite an interesting case study already in our business. Um, one of our divisional directors, which is one level down from the board, has gone to four days a week, has, has um, become the first part-timer in our business at that level. And I think that shows the way for us uh, in the future. The other opportunities in job sharing. If I, again, if I look at our store managers, we're beginning to make inroads into job sharing being an acceptable way uh, of managing those mm. the transitional years as, as, you, as your child rearing. So there, there are a couple of ideas wrapped up in that. And I think, again, as we start to see our business develop over the next five or 10 years, we'll start seeing that becoming a more acceptable way of working. So I guess this is probably for all of the panel, really. Um, you know, where are retailers missing out that perhaps are not embracing uh, you know, that parity on boards? Um, I obviously don't come from a retail background, although I did used to work for Marks and Spencers when I was at school. So uh, um, I feel um, the thing is, um, it's shown on boards they have a 26% higher performance mm. if, if it's a, a gender balanced board. Um, and 70% of retail choices, um, uh, decisions are made by women. So, I mean, why? It's a business, it's a business case. Why wouldn't? Boards want to be um, gender balanced, include more women, be more flexible on the basis that um, we need to get away from this culture whereby people are only valued on how many hours they spend at a desk rather than their output, their performance and their contribution. But um, I think what you said, Wendy, about bringing people through the pipeline is very key. Um, we need m much stronger mentors, role models um, uh, to encourage women to apply for these jobs because often the reason that boards aren't um, gender balanced is just because there isn't a pool of women who want to apply for the job. And sometimes it's not because they don't want to, it's just because they may not feel that they can and it's all about encouraging women. You know, that's this, culture, surely, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's cultural. And, and it's, but it's also about, you know, guys have the... Um, that very much these kind of informal mentoring, um, uh, you know, they go for 
um, golf matches or wh whatever. You know, there's all these sort of old informal. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm just speaking about my. Uh, maybe I'm just speaking about my my working environment. But there are lots of sort of. Um, <laughs> That's politics for you. There are lots of sort of opportunities for the guys to network exclusively of the of the women, and I just feel that we we you know that um, the um, American female politician Madeleine Albright said there's a special place in hell for women that don't help other women. And I feel that we do, you know, that, that sort of mentoring, encouraging. And there's this, um, this sort of old anecdote that um, if a woman's thinking of applying for a job and there are 10 criteria and she's got eight of them, she'll think, I'm not qualified for that. Whereas if a guy is looking at the same criteria and he says, oh, I've got five of those, I'm more than qualified. It's all about sort of mentoring, encouraging, and, and feeding that pipeline to... It's an interesting point that you make because, you know, there were studies that showed that um, girls, by the time they reach secondary school, are three and a half times more likely to have lower self-esteem than boys. And by the time they're age 12, they are un unlikely to become a leader. It goes back to that social conditioning piece, doesn't it? And I, I personally would love to see a, a piece of robust, a robust initiative done by government ar around that age group. Well, I mean, there is. There, I mean, there are things like um, the This Life campaign, which is about trying to encourage more girls to get into STEM subjects really early on, so science, um, technology, engineering, maths, because if they discount those subjects as being boy subjects right from the start of their academic career, they're kind of counting themselves out of some of the highest paid professions. So in the top 10 um, highest paid professions in the UK, seven of them have the word engineer at the end. And if you don't take any of your sciences, you're already discounting yourself from those professions. So things like the This Life campaign, which is, again, it's all about mentoring, but it's about role models and about showing girls that what they can, what they can achieve. It's, yeah, I, mean, I think that's really important. I think we, when we did the Women's Business Council report, we looked really closely at that, and we found that the issues all start in the classroom not in the boardroom, and it is about subject choices. And I think only 18% of engineering graduates are female. So there's huge underrepresentation there that needs to be fixed. And the mentoring comes in by businesses connecting with schools and universities in a meaningful way so that interesting jobs can be exposed to young girls um, and interesting subject choices selected. But, you know, there's a whole host of measures from mentoring, to inform choices, to subject choices. We, we need to go right back to school and spend a lot of time in schools to, to fix this problem for good. I mean, as the father of a 22, 19-year-old girls... I'll don't be, look at Mike. <laughs> I mean, again, I would be mortified if they didn't have that sort of ambition and, mm. and drive mm. and, and feel that somehow that they were unequal to men, I would be absolutely mortified by that idea. But I think there's something about mentoring in schools. Uh, we do work where our colleagues go into schools, they talk to kids, usually 14 to 16, as a kind of sweet spot of age where kids are more receptive to understanding the diverse nature of the opportunities mm. we have as a business. And I think that is something that can be that we can do more of, and particularly biased towards uh, trying to get more women into our mm. workplace on a broader, a broader base. So, I, I mean, I think all of those things are really valuable, but I think if we take it back to, you know, the buy-in, if you like, at board level or leadership level, I'd really be interested to know what each of you think about boards that are not embracing this, what would you say they are missing out on? Do you want to start, Well, I think they're missing out on a rich seam of insight. Um, they're, they're not in touch with their customer base. I mean, it, this is a, an industry that's dominated by women in the purchasing sense. So if our job is to understand our customers better than anyone else, then they're missing out on deep customer insight. It, it, it's madness, really, isn't it? If you've got 70% of your customers are women making those purchasing decisions, and that demographic is then not you know, represented on, on your board. Well, quite. So it, I, I think that's what, where you're missing out. And clearly, you know, again, all the studies show that businesses that have diverse management teams are not only more effective, but they're better at serving customers and have better cultures for people to want to work in and stay in. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just normal behavior. It's mm. abnormal to have an all-male or all-female anything. Mm. I agree. I, I, I agree with Sarah. I, 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 if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's that women think differently to men. 
Uh, and I think um, <laughs> sometimes a lesson hard learned, it has to be said. Um, That's being in a household of all women. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> it's taken me a long time to get there. But, but, you know, it's just a fundamental... Our customers are predominantly women, and fundamentally you'll get a, a broader range of views, a more diverse range of views, and a completely different perspective mm. on, a, on a problem or an issue. And I, if you only get 50% of the potential options available to you, you're really closing... Uh, you, I think you have a duty, a responsibility mm. as a leadership team to make sure that there's diversity. I agree. Yeah. Well, I just mean from I started out in business. I started my business when I was 19, and from a business point of view, it doesn't make sense that if your majority of your customers are women, you're not reflecting that in your board. I mean, how can you, you know, how can you possibly reflect what your consumer needs if you if you're not? You know, if you're not um, uh, representative of them in, at, at the high, highest possible level, it doesn't make well, sense. Well, you know, when I look at my own board, I've got 50-50, actually, men and women, and I'll always, always recruit the best person for the job. It isn't about, oh, I've got to have so many women or so many men. And when I look around the table, you know, I, I can't really say that, you know, women do this or men do that differently. They're all as good as each other. Mm. Um, so, you know, mm. I, I, I think the key is just, you know, it's about that... For me, and I'm 50-50 as well on my board, is that it's the diversity of the talent and the, the way of thinking. And um, certainly, um, and I have the added, slightly added complication that my husband is uh, also in the business with me. And we are so diverse in how we look at problems and issues. And it's just great having um, men and women um, and the way we, we think and do things differently. It, it, and it really, we have very, very lively debates because we all do think differently but we you know hopefully we get to then the uh, right decision at the end I run um, a competition on on Twitter for women in business and they tweet me tweet me their business every Wednesday just gone um, and I, I'll profile the, the top three and we do mentoring days and mentoring lunches and and when I meet when I meet with these women who by the way are hugely talented have great great business ideas and, and, and businesses it always astounds me how many have actually left big corporations and actually chosen to go and do their own small business because they just feel that there is no opportunity for them in these big organisations, that there is this glass ceiling. So my question to you, Wendy, is how, how do we retain that talent? I mean, that's exactly um, what, what happened to myself. I, I left um, corporate life when I, my two children were very, very young um, because I wanted a very flexible way of um, working. By working for myself, I was able to, to, to achieve that. Um, it's interesting, the work we've done on the Women's Business Council, one of the biggest um, issues that came through was childcare and the cost of childcare. So um, I think that area, and obviously the government has gone to, and we, you know, it was something that we were very, very keen to achieve um, and to influence was the tax breaks on childcare. But there is still such a long way to go because there are, for a lot of women who are very talented, they don't come back to work because the cost of childcare outweighs um, what they will earn. I mean, I know the government back. has done some great things with childcare. Yeah, so free childcare, um, tax-free childcare for um, children from the age of two, starting from September this year, which will, you know, on average save um, uh, parents two thousand pounds per child. But you know, I, I fully understand. Um, I, my children are now twelve and seven, so um, it's been a while since they were in, um, you know, childminders and that sort of thing. But it was a massive expense. I mean, it was a huge expense. But I think um, there are a couple of other things here. I think actually what we want is, to, is that women are allowed to do what they want to do. So if actually they want to be able to be mums and run their own smaller business um, at the same time, that's great. What we, what we want is an environment whereby people don't feel prohibited from continuing in, uh, in a big corporate um, company if that's what they want to do. So, I mean, it's, so um, it's very difficult. If you are, a, I'm a mum, if you're, if you're you, you can't win. You know, if you're a mother that doesn't work, you're regarded as, um, as lazy. If you're a mother that um, works um, full time uh, with children, you're regarded as heartless. You know, it's, it, it's, being a mother is all a little bit about, about guilt from, from day one. So if we, I think if women do want to um, 
set up their own businesses and, and be able to combine it with childcare, that's great. It, it's just what we don't want is for women to be prevented from, from staying on in corporate life if that's what they want to do. And I think there is one other issue here as well, and I think that's often when people have gone on a, on a, on a break to have children, there is a slight barrier to overcome in terms of your own self-confidence at going back um, into that workplace. And I think big businesses have a role to play here at encouraging, you know, if you've been out of the workplace maybe for a year or two, you may feel that somehow you've slipped behind the drag curve, that you're not quite as current as you were, that you've somehow lost um, the edge. And I think um, that it's really important that um, big companies make their staff feel um, that they've still got masses to mm. contribute, that they're still a very vital part of And that of the, contact, of the, that ongoing contact yeah. during that that maternity leave period I think is absolutely vital. It can be really isolating. I've got a number yeah. of my girlfriends that have dropped out of, um, of big corporate life just yeah. because of that, because of the lack of confidence. I personally would also like to see a reform of the, is it the NCT? The, uh, you, you know, because I think that's outdated. I don't think it necessarily, you know, fits in with the modern woman who wants to have both, you know, wants to have a family and wants to, you know, continue working as well. So it would be great to see that, um, you know, uh, those classes be extended to confidence, building confidence. I mean, one of the one of the points that's been made al already is is how government policy can help shape societal mm. uh, understanding of, of child rearing being a partnership rather than being one or other's responsibility. So, um, one of the interesting things about the current framework is that there's much more maternity leave than paternity leave. One of the mm. things that government certainly could do is think about how they might join that together as a more holistic approach to child rearing, child care, rather than something which is, by its very nature, creating the kind of diver uh, you know, um, yeah, choices that people are forced to make. That's interesting. What do you think about that idea? Well, we have, I mean, we've brought, brought in, done more to address shared parental leave than any um, previous government. So I think there's a lot of progress been made in this. But I think it's it's more about somehow addressing the culture that um, uh, that. Um, parents understand that you know bringing up children is everybody's responsibility. You know, and it doesn't. At the end of the day, in my family and I and in lots of my friends' families, the buck always stops with the mum. Despite the fact that I have I'm divorced, but I have shared custody with my ex-husband. When one of my children isn't very well, or when there's an issue, the buck always stops with with the mum. And, um, and and I think that um, there is a culture that you know that the, the women are always responsible for whatever, whether it be child caring, whether it be other kind of caring responsibilities, mm. whether yeah. any sort of domestic chores around the house. The buck always tends well, generally it stops with the woman. And and um, we need there's a culture change needed there to address that. I think, and that's mm. a, that's a much bigger ask. Mm. I think. Um, the maths of returning mums is tough for a lot of returning mums and tax relief on childcare for everybody would make such a big difference. But also, you know, this is the danger moment when a lot of middle and senior management women do fall out and don't come back into the workplace. So I think culturally there's an opportunity there for returning mums to help other returning mums um, and for that to be operated at a company level um, with various policies in place to encourage returning mums, not just the first time, but the second mm. and third and fourth time, to keep coming back. So uh, it, it's a big danger period. It's it, Certainly the Lord Davis report on women on board showed that you know fall away at the top was happening a lot. That's a real danger period. Uh, women in their 30s, um, not coming back after. So if you could have, leave. you know, one change, what that would help that? What would oh, it be? It, for me, that would be tax relief on childcare for everybody. Mm. I've always wanted that. Um, we've gone, we made a huge load of progress in the Women's Business Council report, but I think we all wanted to take it even further. Tax relief massive. for everybody. Is that, is that feasible? I mean, it's a massive cost, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's not feasible in the current economic environment, but it's certainly an aspiration because you know it, it, it's a it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Getting all these sort of people who have huge wealth of experience and an enormous economic potential mm -hmm. back into the workplace, um, it, you know, is a is a is a no-brainer. But um, given the parlous state of the country's economy, I think it would be a difficult yeah. one at the moment. Understandably, but I think you know, I think we've all, when we've spoken to other women, if there was one thing they could want. You're absolutely right. It's around childcare, and the amount of women, you know, that that I've come across who, you know, are actually. I mean, there was there are women that are, it's actually costing them to go to work, yeah. you know, because they're they're they're, they're paying for childcare. Um, just changing the theme, um, Silla. I, I, 
Do you think that women have to behave like men to, to be successful? No, I, I think we want to be equal to men. We don't want to be men. <laughs> and I think the tone with which we approach these issues has to be very measured and practical and collaborative. Otherwise, you just get into man-hating, mm. eye-rolling paralysis. And it's, it's much better to have a collaborative, practical approach by measurement. You know, and I think... But do you think some women still feel they need to do that? I mean, we've all seen evidence of it, haven't we? Well, I, I don't think it's effective. I think you've got to be yourself, and we are different, and we don't want to be men or behave like men. We're different. Caroline, do you find that in Parliament? Oh, there are a number of women in, in um, Parliament who feel that they have to be like men in order to, um, in order to succeed. Um, <laughs> and, um, and some won't get involved in women's issues in Parliament because they feel um, somehow like that makes them... Um, somehow not equal in the eyes of, mm. of the chaps, um, which of course is nonsense. We had our International Women's Day debate in Parliament last week and we had it in the main chamber of the House of Commons. Uh, three former Secretaries of State spoke on, the, on our side of the chamber. So it is, it is mm. a big, robust, strong, important issue. Um, so, um, you know, but I've heard over the years, I've heard um, when we were talking about changing the working hours in Parliament to make them less mad, you know, because at one stage we could go all through the night um, with voting and that doesn't really do anybody any favours. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I heard one female colleague say, well, if women... Uh, you know, was one of the reasons put for doing it was that, of course, it doesn't really encourage a very normal family life. People can't get home to their, their, their children. Um, and one female MP was heard saying, well, if um, women don't like it, they shouldn't be in this job, which isn't very helpful, you know, um, in the same way as in the retail sector or any other business, in politics, in order to create um, a, a country that is, you know, and laws that are reflective of the needs of 50% of the population. It's, it's right that we should aspire that 50% of the members of parliament that represent them should be women. We should just be, it's just we need to be reflective of the population as a whole. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an issue. So, Wendy, just, you know, picking up what Caroline's saying there, do you think the same type of women are unsupportive? Because you often hear this, don't you, in certain businesses where they're less supportive of other women? I, I, I think, yes. I think comments are made that there are some um, women that can be unsupportive. I have to say, and I network a lot, um, I just see women who are so, so positive of supporting other women. Mm -hmm. um, you could argue, though, that in all the networking um, circles, that these are the women that want to um, progress the, the agenda. So um, I've personally not really come across it in a big way. Um, but then I suppose I run, you know, I'm, I'm not in a corporate um, environment, although I, I have a lot to do with um, the, the, the corporate retailers. Um, but it's, it's bad. I mean, you know, it, it, we're, we're never going to get anywhere unless um, women themselves support and role model other women. Well, guys, we've managed to cover an awful lot in that, in that 30 minutes. So I think there's probably enough now to, to open up to the floor uh, for questions. Is there people floating around with um, microphones? Anybody like to ask the panel a question? Ah, oh, somebody over here waving their hands. Perfect. Hello, um, my name is David. I'm from uh, Maybe Solutions. Uh, I think this is a really interesting debate. Uh, more, more interesting than I thought it was going to be, if that's somewhat um, <laughs> honest. Um, I can remember, I'll start with a, a slight story, if you'll forgive me. I, I remember the time when I was quite little, probably about 35, 40 years ago, when my mum threw a hoover down the stairs. Um, it was quite new. Uh, we couldn't afford to replace it, but, uh, and she might have been having a generally irritated moment at how many toys there were on the floor. But she threw it down the stairs shouting, this was designed by a man. And I've never forgotten that moment because she just hated this product because it didn't work for her. It feels like here we are, 40 years later, working with, with people who don't really, and you'll, you'll forgive me if I point this in perhaps a little bit at our member apartment, but who don't necessarily understand that there is a responsibility for the government to change how we all perceive anyone in a role doing anything. So men don't get involved enough in, in the home, home um, 
looking after the home, simply because work doesn't look at them in that way. You're not given the same amount of um, flexibilities or when, when your kids are born to, to take that time off. There's no balance between the two. And so it's not, it's not enough to say we've gone, or we've done more than any other government. It's like, but nothing and not enough is happening. And businesses are not connecting enough with, with that and leading that agenda forward either. I do have a question, which is, if you were to apply technology to a change, how would you see technology helping women take a bigger role in business after they're obliged to, to do maternity care for six, nine months? So what impact can technology have? in changing the way equality works in the workplace? Oh, that's a tough question. Who wants to answer that one? Uh, well, I can, I, I, I'll have a go. Um, I think it can make a big difference. Um, certainly, if you start with the approach of work is something you do rather than somewhere you go, you can start opening up a different series of possibilities for how people work, and I think that creates an environment where you have more flexibility, uh, more flexible working, and ultimately that can help overcome some of the issues that we've explored as we've gone through. That requires quite a big investment. If you take our business as an example, we have the best part of 2,500 people working in central London. Working through what that would imply for our organisation is not without its challenges, but the underlying principle of creating an environment where uh, through technology you can work more flexibly and you can work when it suits your lifestyle absolutely sits at the heart of the thing, one of the things that can be done. Yeah. I mean, I think the commitment is there for you're seeing a lot more of that, aren't you, with businesses? But the use of technology, I think, is an interesting, an interesting way of looking at it. Well, I also think that the way technology is taught, and it goes back to the gender imbalance between certain STEM subjects, but I look at my kids and look at their, yeah. their use of technology. You know, that's one of the things that will drive their more equal life in the I agree. future. I agree with that. Anyone else? Lady here? Hi, um, it's Rebecca from Retail Week. Um, I was just wondering if you think um, that there's an issue in terms of boardroom culture at all, um, if that is part of the problem at all in terms of perhaps alienating people slightly, and is there anything that can be done? I think that's a good question. You, Look at me again. Mike or Wendy, <laughs> would you like to pick that up? Probably easier for you because it's, um, it's more... Yeah, well, it's I, I have difficulty simply because... In all my time on boards, I've, I've always been on diverse boards, so it's quite difficult for me to imagine a board that is not diverse. So um, I'm sure in the, in the types of organisations which have already, be, already been highlighted by Jackie, there clearly are cultural issues, because if you can run a retailer with 10 men on the board and no female representation, there has to be some kind of cultural um, issue that needs to be resolved, because you're giving up on 50% of... Um, the, the brain power of the, of the country, so it just doesn't make sense to me. What's your experience, Silla? Well, I mean, I think we, we've got a very balanced board in our business, and gender's not an, an issue at all for us. It's just a very normal, balanced board. Um, but I think sometimes boardroom culture and the formality of it, if it doesn't have a diverse mix of people around the table can be quite paralysing. And I think some of the work that's been done in the non-exec sphere is that you need more than one woman on a board. It's not just a token woman. You need two or three to really have that critical mass. And then I think you solve the cultural issues. But I think people always have the choice that if they don't like the boardroom culture, they will leave. So it's incumbent on any CEO and chairman to make sure that a board culture is positive and balanced and a great place to be. Otherwise, you'll just lose the talent, male and female. And it's just as difficult for, for the men because it feels weird. So I think it, it, it has to sort itself out for companies to be successful. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi. Anybody else? Got a just lady here. Just there. Hi. Um, my name is Courtney, and I work at Facebook. So I just wanted to ask you guys a question. There's been a lot of... Um, feeling around how the government could step in and make changes here. And it's quite interesting that majority of the panel is private sector. So do you feel that there's a responsibility for companies actually to make change and perhaps in the situation of childcare, have childcare facilities within companies to make things more affordable, maybe change wages so that women have the ability to afford childcare if that's an issue, or make more flexible working hours? It just seems like to say that the government needs to do all of that is, you know, maybe passing the buck a bit. Interesting. 
Wendy, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I think it's, it's a really good question. And I think that um, it was something, again, with the work that we did on Women's Business Council, it's absolutely not just the government's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And um, the government can do a lot on policy, but often it's the business that will drive that cultural um, change. And I think there is more um, that businesses can do um, in terms of providing childcare um, and also um, giving a more flexible um, approach for their workforce. I'm going to sort of, and it, it, it is something that I feel really passionate about. Again, I think it is um, about the culture of it's not just the women's responsibility to be worrying about where the child is, dropping the child off at, um, for childcare. And if um, the father has um, childcare facilities at his work, then again, that makes it easier for his wife to, to, to work. So I think it's again getting the businesses to think around um, how they can make it work for both genders, not just for females. We've got a lady here. Hi, it's Emily Lawson from Morrison's. It's more a, a commentary on the discussion as opposed to a question, I apologise, but it's two things I wanted to pick up on. The first is obviously the childcare debate is incredibly important and we need to get the right support in place. But I'm a bit with Courtney in that all of the data shows that issues with childcare and women taking leave to have children, etc., does not explain the lack of progression of women inside organisations. And once you get women back, so there is a the decision about whether they come back or not, once women come back, women with children actually get promoted more um, than women who don't have children. Um, so the, all of the data from 30% Club, which I'm on the steering committee from the McKinsey research I did previously, says that it's broadly companies are just not promoting women at the same rate, as opposed to you can explain it because women choose to leave or because the childcare is inadequate. Obviously, the more we can do to fill holes to stop women leaving employment in the first place, the better. But I'm nervous that we start going straight into the discussion about flexible working and how the government can support, etc., without tackling the fundamental issue, which things like Mike's initiative to make sure there are balanced slates for all senior roles have a much bigger impact on overall in terms of really pulling those incredibly talented women all the way through from the front line into the top of retail organisations. And inter I'm just interested to know what, what your challenges are or in your own business in, in Morrison's? Sure. Well, I've, I've been there 18 months and one of the things I did do was to um, introduce balanced slates. So we've had those going for about eight months and um, I hate to give Mike some competitive information, but there you go. Um, <laughs> but our, our senior management group's gone from 20% women to 26% women um, over the last year because all of the roles that we've considered over that period, we've said, it's not just about women, but you have to consider somebody for, it's, for whom it's a big step up, somebody for whom it's a cross-business move, and somebody who's a woman. Mm -hmm. And so, that obviously, all three could be in the same person. And you don't have to give them the job, but you have to consider it, and then you have to give feedback about why the relevant person got the job. Um, and that's made a big difference. And then, obviously, there's a bunch of other initiatives that need to go to support that, including unconscious bias training for everybody who recruits inside Morrison's so that people are aware of the choices that they're making when they give people a job. And to be clear, we've got a long way to go. Yeah. So we have 70% employment for women at the front line, and you know, I'm the only woman on the management board, so I'm not pretending like everything's fantastic either, and there's a massive journey to take. But I think we need to own up as large corporations the fact that it's not just about childcare. The one thing that women really do do much more than men do and the consequent um, mm. responsibilities afterwards it is a bit of the problem, but it do can't be the only part of the debate. Do you feel, though, that the large organisations can really help in Absolutely. setting the tone, yeah. can't they? Yeah. And, you know, we've just introduced childcare vouchers for Morrison's colleagues, and it is making a difference, but it's, it's not going to be the only thing that we need to do in order to address, you know, the lack of flow through of women from the front line. OK, thank you very much. I think that's all we've got time for now. Um, I've, it's certainly been a fascinating discussion. We could talk about this subject for the rest of the day, probably all of tomorrow as well. So I'd really like to first uh, thank my panel for being so frank and open, if you'd give them a round of applause. <laughs> and also to you, the audience, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I certainly enjoyed leading it. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.